using the milling machine. Its purpose is to accurately remove material from a workpiece. There are three axes on the machine. The X axis, the Y axis, and the Z axis. To turn on the machine, we're going to use the power switch located up here. There are two settings on the power switch. You have the high range and the low range. Before we can turn on the machine, you have to make sure it's in the right gear. Before you start machining, you have to visually make sure that you are in the right speed range. Generally, we work in the high mode. So make sure this knob is pointing in that direction. If it is not, please ask a TA for help. Do not attempt to adjust the knob yourself. Now that we check the gear, we can turn the machine on to high range. And to shut it off, you just go back to the middle area. Turn on the machine and reference the rabbit side of the speed adjustment panel. Turn the handle accordingly and your RPM will change. So now we're going to go over the controls located in this area of the machine. First one's a friction lock. Second one is a spindle lock. You push this button down and allow you to move it up and down. What this allows you to do is to use this handle and operate the milling machine like a drill press. This part down here is called a quill. And the part over here that actually rotates is called a spindle. To the part that we're going to be machining, we're going to use a component called a vise. Make sure your workpiece is properly deburred and is free of chips. Walk over to the mill table and open the parallels box. Grab the appropriate size parallel and separate them. The reason why we do this is so it doesn't fall out of your hands when transporting it to the mill. Make sure your vise is clean and free of chips. After you do that, take your parallels and very gently place them in the vise. So take your workpiece and gently place it on top of the parallels and clamp with about five pounds of force. Grab a mallet from the mill table and gently tap it into place. After you do this, now you can apply about 30 pounds of force on the handle. Always remove your parallels after you have clamped your workpiece. Now that we've loaded the workpiece, we can load an end mill into the machine. Make sure your vise is away from the spindle area. It's absolutely critical that the quill is located in the uppermost position along with the spindle lock. If you do not do this, you will damage the machine. When handling an end mill, be sure to hold it by the shank or use a rag and hold it by the flutes. Go to the collar rack on the left side of the machine and select the appropriate collet. The best one always has a line fit. Using an air gun, make sure there are no chips in the collet. This is our collet and tool assembly. When inserting this into the machine, make sure there's about an eighth of an inch gap between the beginning of the flute and the collet. So take our assembly and insert it into the spindle. Make sure it is fully seated by rotating it. Now go to the tool changer, push the green safety button, and in until the tool is seated. After you have inserted the tool, grab a rag and tug on your tool to ensure that it is properly seated. Notice that all of the dimensions are referenced off of a single point. Our zero will be located here. Many dimensions have varying degrees of precision. They indicate the tolerance of the specific feature. Look at the number of digits after the decimal point. For this specific feature, we have three digits. Now reference the tolerance table and line up the precision with the process. In this case, our tolerance is plus or minus 5 thou. This means our feature can be between 0.495 and 505. Make sure you're wearing the proper eyewear, roll up any long sleeves, tie back any long hair, and remove any jewelry or watches. Whenever you're using the machine, always maintain an 8 inch sphere of safety. You never want your hands to go past that sphere. To find your Z0, turn on the machine and slowly bring the tool to the part. The first chip you see indicates a zero. Once you have touched off the part, loosen the lock nut, rotate the dial to zero, and tighten the lock nut. The max depth of cut in this lab is 50 thousandths of an inch. We're going to turn on the spindle and slowly ram it into the part. Make sure you keep your hand on the table while you're machining to feel for vibrations. Make sure you slowly ramp into the part.
Now we're going to use the power feed feature. What the power feed does is it automatically moves the X axis handle for you at a consistent rate. There are three positions on the power feed left, neutral, and right. Since we want our table to move left, we're going to move the direction lever to the left. To activate the power feed, turn the speed adjustment knob until the axis starts moving. You can change the speed by rotating the knob. When you are done with the power feed, rotate the speed adjustment knob to zero, and then turn the handle back to the middle. Whenever auto feeding, always keep your hand on this knob for two reasons. If you need to stop the machine immediately, you can switch it to zero and it will stop. The second reason is there is a pinch point on this machine. If your hand is anywhere besides where the knob is located, your hand can get pinched between the handle while it is auto feeding. We are now going to do an auto feeding pass. Turn on the machine, we push the direction lever to the left, and slowly rotate the knob until it starts auto feeding. Again, you want to slowly ramp in, and once you have a good engagement, you can increase your feed rate. For time considerations, we have already machined five sides of the part. All we have to do now is cut the part to length. Our target length is four inches. We are currently at four inches and 18 thousandths of an inch over our target. We must do a radial pass to remove all of this material. Before doing this operation, make sure your part has a decent amount of overhang to prevent interference with the vise. Turn on the spindle and slowly bring the tool to the part. When your tool has touched the part, push this X zero button. With the tool away from the part, go to your depth of cut. In our case, it is 18 thousandths of an inch. Slowly feed the tool into the part. Now we're going to remove this end mill. It's the same steps as before. The only difference is, is you're going to push the out button instead of the in button. One thing to make note of is to cup your hand under the tool. For drilling operations, we're going to use a Jacobs chuck. To establish our datums, we're going to use a tool called an edge finder. To use an edge finder, make sure you offset the bottom part of it and turn on the spindle. So we bring the edge finder to the part until it becomes more and more concentric. Eventually, it will kick out. When the edge finder kicks out, zero out the respective axis. Move the edge finder out of the way. Now offset your zero a hundred thousandths of an inch. We offset our tool a hundred thousandths of an inch because it moves our zero to the center line of the spindle. Repeat the same steps for the Y axis. This feature indicates 10 24 threaded holes in four places. The 157 through hole is the tap drill size for the 10 24 threads. This center drill hole is 3125 in diameter, or more commonly known as 5 16 The tight tolerance indicates the use of a reamer. The 196 diameter feature is a clearance hole for a number 10 fastener. This will allow a number 10 fastener to freely pass through the workpiece. C sync stands for countersink. A countersink is a feature used to provide clearance for flathead screws. This is rarely seen in lab parts. For drilling operations, we always want to start our holes with a center drill and then an eighth inch. After that, you do eighth inch step ups until you get to your desired diameter. When performing drilling operations, lower your spindle lock to operate your mill similar to a drill press. We have loaded the center drill into the Jacobs truck. Add oil to the estimated drilling location. Turn on the machine and perform a light peck. Repeat this step for all of the hole features. We now have an eighth inch drill bit loaded into the machine. We're going to turn on the machine and slowly peck drill into the hole feature.
as needed, shut off the machine, wait for the spindle to stop, and apply more oil. Repeat these steps until we have completed all the holes. A quarter inch drill bit is currently loaded into the machine. The only hole feature that allows us to go to this size is the center hole right here. Turn on the machine and repeat the process. There is a 196 clearance drill loaded into the machine. There are four features that require this size. Currently there is a 157 tap drill loaded into the machine. It will be used on these four hole features which will later be cut into 1024 threads. Because this feature is a 516 hole with a very tight tolerance, it requires the use of a reamer. You must drill the hole a 64th of an inch under its target size. In this case, the drill bit we are currently using is 1964. Make sure you lower your RPM for the increased diameter tool. Now we're going to use a reamer to produce our tight tolerance feature. When using the reamer, turn on the machine and spin it at 500 RPM. Be very careful. This is a countersink tool. There are four features in our drawing that require this. Once we achieve our desired diameter, we will mark it with the spindle lock. Using this procedure, we can have very consistent results. Our last process requires cutting a 1024 thread into our part. You have to use three components to achieve this. A spring-loaded tap guide, a 1024 tap, and a tap handle. The tap and the tap handle are combined as an assembly. We've loaded our spring-loaded tap guide into the chuck. Now we will take our tap assembly and insert it between the spring-loaded tap guide and the part. Now we'll do two full revolutions and half a revolution back. Repeat this process. Use oil as necessary. After all of this work, we've finally finished our part. Now, completely clean your machines.